Poundland's Power Geek Car Charger. This is a charging cradle that you drop your phone into. It doesn't just grip the phone while you're travelling, but it also charges it using a built-in inductive charger, a Qi charger or QI charger, if you so prefer. Let me demonstrate this fetching shade of black, which is just the worst colour to record, by putting an equally black phone in, and as the phone goes in, the weight of it just presses down and the wings grip onto the side of the phone. And it would take a charge if this one had inductive charging. It doesn't. Because if you have an absolute brick of a phone like I have, then when you put it in, it doesn't really fit, but you can kind of mush it in. Not so great. But that's just because I have an unusually freakishly big phone. Other things worthy of note about this, before we open it. It has this little lightning bolt in the middle here, and that is where the inductive pickup coil, or the transmitting coil is. Um, and to center your device in that for maximum efficiency, it, it would really help if they marked in the back of phones where the coil was. But you can adjust it up and down in little incrementable steps to actually fine-tune the spot. So when you sit it in, it perfectly sits on that uh, point. Let me plug this in. It plugs into a 2-amp power supply. I shall plug it into this black view. In fact, you know what? We'll plug this uh, little USB power monitor in as well. Is that the 5-2-amp power supply? Yes, it is. And I shall plug the unit in, and just out of interest, we'll see what it sort of displays. It's booting up, and I shall then sit this in. Oop. And the current has gone up to a fairly miserable 380 milliamps because it's not perfectly lined. It's all a matter of finding the sweet spot of where that coil is. Is it going to go any higher? No, it's saying 268 milliamps. In reality, it should, it is rated to draw two amps, but put out five watts of power, which it would be exactly 50% efficiency, which is not surprising because these things are notoriously inefficient. It is charging the phone, but I think the positioning of it is a bit critical and also the fact that the case on probably doesn't help okay so if you want to mount it into your car you've got this little thing which uh, clamps onto ventilation grills so you can snap them off your vehicle things that they, they, they weren't actually designed for in the first place but you may have a suitable point in the car for that or you might have a suitable cradle mounting point but it goes in the back like this and it's got this uh, universal joint so you can swivel it and then lock it Okay, now you've seen that bit. Let's open it up. So I have noticed that there is a little screw in here. And I'm going to be trying to guess what's inside. There'll be the classics of strangely ferrite coil. Ew. Um, and then there'll probably be a little circuit board associated with that, but very minimalist circuitry. All I'm seeing so far is the complex mechanism will drop out explosively into pieces. Oh, right, okay, okay. Oh, there's some some screws. If I get the correct size of screwdriver here, it'll do. It could also be useful as a just a donor for the actual the charge coil for building it into your own things. There is, they do another version as well, for also for a fiver. It's a little uh, matte version. I could show you that. Oh, it's got quite a big coil. That's quite good, because... Uh... Oh, maybe it's the same... Uh, no, it won't be the same circuitry. Okay. That's the other one, by the way. The, uh, the Power Geek wireless charger, the little platinum one, which says input max 2 amp and output 5 volt at 1 amp. And that sounds about right again. Very inefficient. It's not, not a great way of doing it, but it has the advantage that in the case of this phone, I use inductive charging because it saves opening and closing the little waterproof flap all the time. Let's see if we can get this out and analyse what we've got. There will be the classic ferrite coil, core, this plate, with that heavy coil on it, as is so often the case. It's always this material, is it? Some high temperature resistance material they're using for this. But this is the bit that does the 
uh, power transfer, but it also does a bit of communication because when you initially have this sitting there, it won't be active. It will just be pulsing every so often, just waiting for a device to be placed in its vicinity. When a, a device does get placed in its vicinity, the receiving device will detect that pulse in the coil uh, and it will send information back saying, I would like a charge and you know it might negotiate a current um, and then it, the charging will start. Okay, tell you what, I'm going to take some pics of this circuit board. It's very much a one-sided circuit board and we shall see what the circuitry looks like. Um, although it's going to be based around a proprietary uh, charging chip. But we'll take a look at that. One moment, please. Okay, I have kind of reverse engineered it as far as I can go. The bit that's hobbling me here is this anonymous chip, which could be a dedicated chip or could actually be a microcontroller. I'm not really sure. Um, I would expect it to be a dedicated chip, but knowing some of the wily things get up to, it could well be a microcontroller, particularly given some of the circuitry here. So let's take a look at notable things. We have the incoming USB supply, and as well as the power legs taken off that, we have the three pins are actually taken over to the, the device. There is a current sense resistor with lots of decoupling to the supply rails. I'll show you that in the schematic afterwards. There is an H bridge of four transistors, MOSFETs, which can effectively pull the coil, which is these two wires here. It can pull it positive and negative um, at either end. And in series with that is with the coil is a cluster of two capacitors in parallel. I don't much like the fact that the solders run right onto the end of this capacitor because that can put stress on these uh, multi-layer ceramic capacitors and it can cause them to fracture. The coil, there's a, a little diode comes off and it goes right over to here and then there's a complex filter circuit which I'll show, show you. A couple of LEDs, a couple of resistors, a little resistor capacitor for the power supply and a little resistor for programming something. That is more or less it. So if you want to actually have a go at reverse engineering this yourself and to be honest I don't recommend it because it's not a straightforward circuit. But uh, here is the uh, top the component layer and flipped for your convenience here is the underside of it the back of the circuit board. Okie dokie, let's bring in the notepad and I'll show you some notable things. So here's the USB supply command that splits up the positive rail here, negative rail here, and this is the sense resistor. The sense resistor is decoupled on the other side to the positive rail. It's a very low value point, 0 0.02 ohms. But this thing uh, looks as though it draws very high current spikes. That's maybe why it didn't seem to play well with the power bank when I tried it on it, but it worked absolutely fine when I plugged it into a generic 2 amp power supply. Uh, it's got this little filter circuit across, and then that point there with a the little dot actually goes over to this chip, so it could be either a dedicated input or an analog input on a processor. The chip itself has a power supply composed of a resistor and capacitor for decoupling, and then down to the positive and then to the negative, that just keeps it sort of fairly isolated from all the electrical noise that this thing's creating. It has a couple of LEDs with resistors. It has that resistor that sets the uh, sets some random parameter, and that resistor can be set to intermediate voltages. It's it's an odd setup they got there. They've they've covered themselves for various eventualities. And then it's got the three connections to the USB port. It's got the one, two, three, four outputs to drive the MOSFETs directly. It's got three connections to this little sense circuit, which I'll go over later. And then it's got that one sense input there. And it all adds up to 16 pins. They've used every pin of that chip. The MOSFET arrangement, you've got two A19Ts, which are P-channel MOSFETs pulling up to the positive leg. I've got the matching uh, MOSFET A09T or A09T pulling N channel MOSFET pulling to the negative leg. And they're basically switching these in pairs like this. And each time they do that, the polarity across this coil and capacitor swaps because in, this end is connected up to positive and this end's connected to negative and then this end's connected up to positive and this end's connected to negative. And when that happens, a pulse of current will be allowed to go through this coil, through this capacitor. In this case, two capacitors. In some of the designs, they just show a single capacitor, but in this case, they've got two, possibly to save space or reduce the impedance. The wire, the coil, is lit. 
It's lit wire which is designed to operate at high frequency and this is potentially operating at like 100 kilohertz or something like that. It's very high frequency, I think. Um, but uh, it's a bundle of fine strands of insulated wire. Each core is insulated, but it, basically, if you can imagine a piece of stranded wire, but each core is insulated, but then wrapped around in a fine thread on the outside and then just basically pressed and sandwiched onto this with a bit of adhesive to hold it in place. It feels quite rigid. It's, it is mostly copper. It's quite unusual because it is mostly copper with a very thin coat. And there's a good chance that the reason they've put the fiber stuff on is uh, just to actually use the absolute minimum uh, coating on it to actually get the cables as close together as possible. The sense circuit, there is a diode that comes from this position. Now, in operation, there is communication between the two devices. The This unit may send a, a signal saying, you know, is anything there? It won't just be on all the time. It'll send, it'll pulse, and it'll look for a response. And when the receiving circuitry does response, it can basically modulate the load, I believe, in this coil. And that is possibly part of the reason for this diode. But this diode goes it goes through this diode over to the sense circuit. This is the ground here. It goes through a resistor, simple potential divider, then a network of capacitors and resistors. And that's a common filter arrangement, which is obviously just filtering out a specific frequency. And then I guess the end, and there are three pins in the chip. Uh, there are these three pins here, with two of them actually connected together. And I'm guessing from that arrangement, that this might be an op amp built into the chip, which has uh, its output programmable by, by either a resistor or just loop back to the negative input to make it sort of unity gain. It just buffers that signal up. So this appears to be taking whatever's happening there, filtering it, and then uh, applying it to that uh, to the chip, and the chip has that bit built in. Is there anything else worth discussing about this? It, it seems, the description seems so simple when, yes, there is something we're worth the two end channel MOSFETs, this is what makes me wonder if this is a microcontroller. They have resistors, 200k resistors going to the zero volt rail to keep them turned off from, from their gates. There's also a couple of capacitors across the, the positive MOSFETs. I'm not sure, therefore, I'm guessing it might be to filter any sort of switching transients and noise. But initially, when if this was a processor, initially when turned on, its outputs would not be a known state. So there's a risk that if you turned on this MOSFET and this MOSFET, or they were just floating, the because MOSFETs are very sensitive, it just stray voltages in the vicinity can actually turn them on. But if both this one and this one, or this one and this one turned on, you'd have a short across the, the five volt supply and a lot of current would flow. It's possible that the reason they've got these resistors here is to pull these MOSFETs into a known off state, because it doesn't matter how many of these two up here are active or not active, they can't really short out from positive to negative as long as these ones are off. So it's possible that they've just done that to the two at one end with those resistors, just so that until this is stable and it assigns those as outputs and starts running, then uh, it will actually make sure there's no conflict up to that point. That's just a theory. I'm not really sure. I'd like to know what that chip is. I couldn't find any data on it at all. It's very vague. I could find other manufacturers, but they had big, huge, complex chips. I could not find a 16-pin one. So that's uh, really as far as we can go with that. I am very tempted, though, to take this chip off and see if there's anything printed underneath. I don't know if there'll be anything printed underneath. People say occasionally when I've mentioned that the chips are blank that they might be printed underneath and that the reason for that could be that uh, if it's a pick-and-place machine, it picks it up and then it hovers over a camera to get the alignment. There may be text and alignment marks underneath it, and that would also let it identify it was the correct chip. I'm not sure how sophisticated those are if they just rely on people loading the correct chips in. Um, but I'm, actually, you know what? I'm going to remove that chip. I'm going to get this the flux on it and the heat gun, and I shall pop that off and we'll see if there's anything printed underneath it at all. Well, I've taken it off and there is no mark underneath the only code as such is a embossed in a circle in the middle and it just says F309, but I think that's a manufacturing code for the package itself and not the actual chip that's in it. So uh, the answer is it's still a mystery chip and I'm not surprised. It's such a specialist application that those chips will probably be specific to the manufacturers involved. 
But there we go. It was worth taking it off to have a look. Let's see if I can actually solder this back on successfully now. And we'll power it up and see if it draws. Lads, it's a current. So I'm going to squirt on, actually. Let's just flood the thing with flux. I mean, that's what Lewis Rossman does. Got to put on at least two millipoles of flux here. And then I'm going to get my huge, unfeasibly large solder yarn. No, it's too big, big clive. And I'm going to just flood solder onto it. Never carry solder to the joint. It's okay when you're using flux in it. And then I'm just going to drag it along all those pins. And we'll see what happens. I'll actually add more. I'm just going to flood it. I can take some off afterwards if needs be. Oh, that's looking very, that's looking ridiculous, actually. That is far too much. This is what happens when bears do surface mount. It's very, very ham-fisted. I'm going to scoop some off. This is not how you do it in Chinese factories. But you know what? I've got a good feeling about this. And I don't mean in the sort of carnage of smoke and flames effect. Okay, so let's get this over here. On the trumpy brick, not that the trumpy brick is needed anymore, apparently. Okay, so let's scrape off all the excess solder. Can you tell I don't do surface mount much? Not uh, resoldering resurf chips like this, but that's looking pretty good. That's looking pretty good. Okay, I'm going to get the coil. I'm going to zoom back out. And I'm going to go back down to that level and focus on that. And I'm going to get the coil. I'm going to take a look at that through a little magnifying glass first, just in case I've done something terrible. It's ugly, but the solder's there. It's on the pins. It, everything's connected. It doesn't look that bad. Oh, I'll probably wash this off with isopropanol before doing anything, just in case all the goo underneath causes it causes it agitation. Well, I'll tell you what, let's add some more flux on these. I'm going to take a bit of solder off that capacitor because I didn't like the fact the capacitor had so much solder on it. So I'm just going to splurge a bit off, which probably puts that... Uh, you know what? Maybe I should actually reflow that with heat, that capacitor, because those uh, multi-layer ceramic film ones get very, very ratty indeed when they're not... Uh, Treated with respect, uneven heating, it causes them to fracture and then they short out because they've got lots of tiny little layers close together. Now, is this the correct way up for this coil? I think it probably wasn't, but that's okay. I don't care. What's the worst could happen? Flames, apparently. Okay. Now, I could rinse this off. I could do a half ass job of rinsing it with uh, isopropanol right now for, for a continuous stream of badness. Uh oh, that is going everywhere. Oh, that, that's probably not what I want to do, but that will do. Um, where's a match when you need it? Yeah, that's that's a mess. That's not. I don't normally do things like that. It's new and exciting. It's adventurous. This is when I'd normally spray it with aerosol, uh, isopropanol. There are, it's very messy looking. I hope those won't all interfere with each other. Well, what's the worst could happen? So let's bring in the power supply. And we'll plug in a power analyzer into it, and we'll see if it shows a ridiculously high current and then smoke comes off it. That would be interesting. Here is the power lead. What's going to happen when I plug this in? Is it going to do anything? Uh, let's watch that uh, little current display here, and I'll look for things emitting smoke and getting hot. Oh, it's only drawing 12 milliamps, and it's flashing its little LEDs, and it's doing things that it's supposed to be doing. Right, okay, tell you what, where's the, uh, where's the phone? Let's uh, see if it will inductively charge the phone now. I've put a little dot there as a sort of marker. It's communicating. It's just started charging it. So, uh, yes, I've successfully put the chip back on. It's not burst into flames. Well, that's nice. It's currently drawing 600 milliamps in the supply, but that's because the battery in here is pretty full. Okay, dokie. Well, that was a success in a way, even if that chip is uh, is mysterious. But uh, if you can guess what that chip is, if you have any idea where that little 16-pin surface mount chip is, I would be interested to know to see if we can find more information about it, if indeed it is a standard chip or just a microcontroller. But that's it. The work has been done. We've analysed it as far as we can go, and it was fairly interesting. A fairly typical design with the H-bridge. 
Um, but quite interesting to ponder whether they have implemented that in a microcontroller instead of using a dedicated chip. That would be quite interesting. That would also be quite clever.